understanding. It's compounded and made worse by anti-Parkinson medicines that tend to lower blood pressure, from levodopa to Mirapex to um, Requip. They all tend to lower blood pressure. It becomes more complicated in a person who's had a history of high blood pressure. They're taking anti-hypertension medicines, and then Parkinson's disease develops and continues. They start not having such high blood pressure, and then they take anti-Parkinson's drugs, their pressure gets lower. And sometimes what needs to be done in terms of dealing with this is taking away the anti-hypertensive medication. Um, so we can treat this. This is one of the, the, the non-motor symptoms that is not difficult to treat, really. In some patients, it's so severe, however, it's very severe, and a lot of the other autonomic nervous system features that I spoke about uh, are so severe that it actually has a, a name of its own. It's called the shy drager syndrome. So it's Parkinson's syndrome plus severe autonomic nervous system dysfunction. It's shy drager syndrome. It's, um, it's not a rare disorder. We see it quite often. But it's a lot less common than Parkinson's disease, in which all of these things happen, but to a lesser degree. In other words, autonomic nervous system does become involved in the illness. Um, so typically, if someone has this, I look and see what medicines they're on. Uh, if they're on a diuretic, just lowering the blood pressure, I might stop that, or I might speak with their um, cardiologist if they're on antihypertensives, I might stop that. And then I might have them wear TED hose that go all the way up to the thigh. It's, it prevents pooling of blood in the lower extremities and drop. That helps. Or increasing salt intake, or telling the kidneys to hold on to salt. How do we tell a kidney to hold on to salt? Well, there's a medication called Floronef that, that acts on the kidneys to retain salt, and that increases the blood volume, and then there's less lightheadedness. And then other ways, a drug called Midodrine that causes the arteries to constrict a bit. So those are the ways we treat this dizziness sensation on standing. Once we ascertain that that dizziness or lightheadedness is due to drop in blood pressure. I don't know how to ask this, but is my inability to stay hard when I have relations with my wife due to Parkinson's disease? That's, that's a, a question that used to be rarely asked, but people are more open about this now, especially because there is something being done that's advertised, and in, 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 in that's basically uh, Viagra or Cialis. Um, certainly, the autonomic nervous system that responsible for all of these automatic functions that we don't really think too much about um, is responsible for maintaining an erection and having an orgasm. And it, these problems of sexual dysfunction may not be exclusively due to Parkinson's disease. So diabetics, for example, have this. Or even as we age, we, we have uh, some problem with this. But um, in some patients, the use of Viagra has been useful in helping with this. But I usually like my patients, um, male patients who speak about this, to have a consultation with their urologist, are there ways to ascertain the cause of this? Is it related to hormonal changes, related to um, diabetes, and so forth? Is my inability to have a normal bowel movement because of Parkinson's disease? Well, yeah, and absolutely. Um, constipation is nothing but difficulty passing stool. And, and the illness itself will cause decrease, uh, how can I say, there's even a pathology in the network of nerves that control the bowel. And the same process that you see in the brain, uh, these deposition of Lewy bodies can be found in the myenteric plexus, which is the network of nerves responsible for controlling the movement of the gut all the way down to the, to the, to the um, colon and, and, and rectum. So the drug, illness itself does affect motility of the gastrointestinal system. Um, and drugs that we use to treat Parkinson's, these can aggravate that, especially the class of drugs called anticholinergic drugs like Artane, Cogentin, Trihexyphenidol, and Benztropine. Those are the drugs we usually use for helping control tremor. Um, I don't like to use it in people over 60 because it can interfere with short-term memory, but I still will use it in moderate doses in low doses, and always with the caveat that it might in inhibit the bladder and it might inhibit the gut. 
someone has a lot of constipation, I might remove this kind of medicine from them. And then the things to do are, are very clear that you would do for anybody that has constipation. By the way, it increases in frequency as you get older. This also, it's everything, as I told you, um, can be uh, mimicked almost by natural aging, but it's much more severe in, in individuals who have Parkinson's disease. Uh, so water, high fiber foods, uh, exercise, polyethylene glycol is, is, is something that some people find very useful. I have to urinate more often during the day and even more at night. Well, what can I do about that? Well, again, autonomic nervous system, which is uh, kind of the silent nervous system responsible for everything that keeps us alive. Uh, yes, that is often related, that's very common in Parkinson's disease, but there are other reasons people can have this. So you gotta make sure that the prostate is not lar enlarged or that the, pr the autonomic nerves aren't involved because of diabetes, which is more likely to cause this than say Parkinson's, but they both can. Um, some patients do well by taking a mild inhibitor of the, of the bladder uh, contraction at nighttime, ditropan. Ditropan will tell the bladder, just don't contract constantly, relax a bit, and that way there's less need to get up frequently during the night. But generally, if, if urinary frequency is an, and difficulty in controlling urination or incontinence is a problem, I often will have a consultation with a urologist. And also make sure there is no bladder infection, because with a bladder infection you can also have um, difficulties with a urination. I have bouts of hot flashes, red face, sweating. Sometimes my feet and hands are cold. Is this related to Parkinson's disease? Since I'm bringing it up at this section, obviously it is related to Parkinson's disease. And it's because the autonomic nervous system controls blood flow to the skin and changes of the innervation of those blood vessels may contribute to the change in color and temperature of the limbs. The real mechanism for it that explains the waves of feeling hot isn't clear, but it tends to fluctuate in parallel to changing blood levels of levodopa. Um, and so sometimes as people wear off, they may have a gradual hot or, or cold spell. Um, and a lot of people, women, have told me that it kind of resembles hot flashes of menopause. Um, if feeling cold is really the more common, and feeling cold all the time when others feel the temperature is fine, I then like to look at the thyroid hormone levels because that could account for feeling cold all the time. Um, the how to treat the hot flashes is, what I usually will do is try to adjust the medicine so the patients are on all the time so they don't wear off. But sometimes that doesn't really have much effect on the hot flashes. I actually learned something new from an Ecuadorian patient who I think it's marvelous and I've been recommending it to some of my patients because it's benign treatment, is drinking a glass of aloe in water every day. I thought that was, you know, an old wives tale. Um, but I have a number of patients who, who can buy aloe in Publix in water, so, and uh, it's not a bad taste. I mean, people usually take it for the bowels, uh, for constipation. But it turns out that at least the last five people I've mentioned this to have done that, and they say, hey, it seems to work with my hot flashes. I have no idea whether this is a placebo effect, but it's fairly benign and might be good for your bowels as well. So. Is PD more than one disease? Oh, that's a, that's a good topic. Well, yeah, it, it, it's, you can classify Parkinsonism uh, in a community, and this has been done um, by studies uh, in which people are, are surveyed, and then, I'm not going to get into the method, but in one report, it was found that about 85% of all the cases we see, community-based evaluation, are idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And that means that we really don't have a good understanding of the cause of the illness. However, about seven to nine percent of the cases that we'll see are related to medications that will block dopamine action and produce a syndrome of Parkinsonism. The neuroleptic drug, also known as the major tranquilizers, distinct from the minor tranquilizers, distinct from Valium and Librium and Ativan, 
The major tranquilizers are like Thorazine and Haldol. And uh, they are very powerful tranquilizers that also can produce as a side effect slowness, rigidity, tremor. Um, take away that neuroleptic drug and the symptoms get a lot better. The other issue is that some patients who take medications, for example, Reglan to promote gastric emptying or Phenergan for nausea, they can get Parkinsonism from that because they block dopamine receptors, especially if you're already you know, 70 years old and there's already a slight compromise in dopamine levels of the brain, then a little bit of these kinds of drugs, like Reglan to promote gastric MTA or Phenergan to um, uh, decrease nausea, can actually precipitate a clinical syndrome of Parkinsonism, which is reversible. If you take that away, you see their symptoms get better. I used to see patients on Triavil often when I was working in Miami. And there was a lot of, it was amazing, there was like a family community doctors uh, would prescribe Triavil to very anxious Cuban women who had problems with sleep. Well, Triavil is a combination of an antidepressant and a tranquilizer. Perfenazine plus amitriptyline. And some of these patients were on that drug and I said, well, maybe if we took that away, and sure enough, a good proportion of them got better. So people thought it was fantastic. There is a cure for Parkinson's disease, obviously not, but some forms of Parkinsonism are reversible. What we call iatrogenic Parkinsonism is reversible. Iatrogenic means caused by the doctor. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, we don't like to say it's our fault, so we say iatrogenic. So it's good to learn those terms. Uh, MSA, that's multiple system atrophy. Those are the complex cases that have many other parts of the nervous system involved. Cerebellum, which, so people have a lot of ataxia, big uh, um, uh, incoordinated movements of the limbs. Uh, stridal nigra degeneration, they tend not to respond to cinemet because you have a lot of the downstream targets where dopamine acts are affected and forget what SDS is. I don't know what you remember. But anyway, I'll c come back to me. Um, PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy, it's again an unusual, it's not that unusual, it's a form of Parkinsonism where there's much more axial midline rigidity and difficulty with vertical gaze, downward gaze, and eventually all gaze. Vascular Parkinsonism associated with small vessel disease in the brain, that's about 3% of the cases. And then there's Parkinson's syndrome due to a bunch of environmental toxicants from MPTP, which is not very common, but there was an epidemic of it in California. Carbon monoxide poisoning, manganese poisoning, recurrent head trauma, they're relatively rare. And then post-encephalitic, caused by viruses, we, it's arguable whether we've seen post-encephalitic cases. I've seen a few cases of Parkinsonism in individuals who had a viral encephalitis but they were of the age that they may have developed Parkinson's disease anyway, so it's hard to say. But that big pandemic of sleeping sickness that resulted in millions and millions of people dying survived from 1917 to 1920-something. A whole bunch of people survived that epidemic, and there is a lot of Parkinsonism associated with this viral infection. And for a point, people thought maybe all Parkinson's disease is nothing but a response to a viral infection. And that has never really been borne out. So what about the underlying pathology of the disease? And pathology is, uh, really requires looking very deeply. I mean, clinical work, we base everything on what we see, feel uh, with the patients, the history. Uh, maybe now with imaging, you don't have, these are living patients, so clinicos means bedside. In Greek. And so clinical aspects, that's what we mostly deal with. The pathologist is the one who knows it all because he deals with the illness after the patient is gone. In other words, examination of tissue, post-mortem examination. So what was discovered about the brains of individuals who died with Parkinson's disease is that there's a, a really interesting phenomenon I guess I call it a phenomenon, but because it's an observation uh, in the brain tissue of these 